a while ago, while talking to a bunch of musician peers of mine, uh, they were complaining in some sense, like, why is there no place in Singapore where artists can find inspiration? Like, why do I have to always go overseas? And a part of me understood, because we do live in one of the most compact cities in the most globalized and busiest age ever in the history of mankind. And there is no real place for a lot of artists to find that quiet solitude and isolation. So, you know, somehow my friends thought that you gotta go somewhere exotic, like, oh, you gotta go to Iceland, you gotta go to New Zealand, you gotta go to America, Europe, wherever. But it's hard to find that kind of solitude here. And a lot of me disagreed and, and I thought, where can I go? Where can I go locally here where I can get away and have our version of the cabin in the woods? And I thought, Pulau Ubin. Pulau Ubin would be a great idea. So, if you're not sure what Pulau Ubin is, Pulau Ubin is an island the northeast side of Singapore. Pulau means island, and Ubin means granite. It has a history of uh, granite quarries. And in the past, there's thousands of people in a huge settlement there when they were mining for granite. But eventually, the population has now dwindled to 23 people on the island. Uh, it's a home to one of the most beautiful wetlands in the world, Chik Jawa, as well as an abundance of natural flora and fauna that you don't see anymore in Singapore, and a home to a lot of exotic birds that are visiting, as well as that residing there. Um, so you have to take a boat all the way out to Pulau Ubin, and when you get there, it is, it's very different. It's not like Singapore, it's not like Malaysia. It's one of a kind. So what I did there was I spent three months and 22 days, about four months altogether, living in a kampong house, traveling around in a bicycle, all by myself as an artist. And this is my home while I was there. I lived in a house that had no electricity or running water. So that was interesting as well, considering I've been a city girl all my life and a musician as well where my routine does not apply to me normally or to any musician. So, it, and I thought to myself, okay, I'm gonna stay here for three, three months and I'm gonna write something amazing. And it was, I had great ideas at first. I was like, maybe I should, you know, record on site, do a record there on the island, but all of my hopes and dreams were dashed when evidently there was no electricity. I did have solar power, but solar power was like, it didn't charge anything beyond 12 volts, which just to put in context for most people would be like, I don't know, three, like 2% on your iPhone for two, two hours. So <laughs> it, was, it, was, it wasn't great. So it's just enough to power a fan on hot days. Uh, I do have a diesel generator, as you can see. But you know, once you turn it on, you could smell it just as much as you could hear it. And it's a really bad idea if you want to record a record. So what I did eventually was carry a little handheld and started sampling sounds all over the island because there was just so much filling my senses. So while I was alone there, I the, started having a routine in my life. I wake up early in the morning, I go out, cycle, um, I feel, experience the island, have coffee by the coffee shop. And one of my favorite things to do is actually to go visit the ponds as well as and go on night rides. So I'll be cycling around in the middle of the night, which is not very safe, I would admit, because there are no street lights whatsoever. I have a little headlight in my bicycle going around. Sometimes I got chased by wild, like wild dogs. But it's, it's really fun, and you actually get to see a lot more wildlife. And at night, you know, after years of living in a city, you are so used to the sound of a fan while you go to bed, or the air, condition, air conditioning blowing. But now you get, got to get used to bullfrogs and crickets while they yak away at night. And it's a very overwhelmingly huge sound. But there's this magic hour in Ubin that I always look forward to looking for, and I would have to stay up all night to find it. And this magic hour happens just before the roosters wake you up and just after the bullfrogs and crickets, they quiet out. And there's this magic hour that sometimes happens for 15 minutes to an hour, it really is temperamental. And you could hear absolutely nothing but the trees breathing, like the spirit of the island actually moving. And that's when the mouse deers come out. Then the birds start to come out. 
I'll go back home, open my door. You can hear the sounds of my door. And start pinning things down. Experiencing the mouse deer for the first time, I was trying to go back home with that question, why am I so enamored by it? It's, it's strangely a creature that is like deeply entrenched in Singapore in a sense where it's native to our country, yet it's slowly endangered and going extinct. It was actually, nobody actually knew that the, that the mouse deers even existed anymore until 2008 when they found a sighting and they were like, oh, they're still around. And that it was really heartbreaking to know that maybe there's something here, that living an endangered existence is important. And it's, it's strange how, you know, mouse deer in the past, this folklore is by locals called Sang Kanjil, where it talks about all these folklore about this, how smart and witty and meek this creature is. But yet, it's really endangered. And there's something here that I felt that maybe Singapore has lost in this island. A uh, story about us, like we need to be, remember what we really were. So I continued staying there, and obviously, I got made friends with a lot of the locals. Uh, they gave me a nickname called Kim Mo Zabo, which is obviously, in the, it means blonde hair gold. It's easy to <laughs> identify me that way. And it was an amazing time, I made a lot of friends. They would invite me for dinner sometimes. Um, and while you hear their stories, a lot of artists that have made Pulau Ubin a subject, for the, a subject of their study, they usually get, a, anger comes in because you understand the political state of the country how, and all of that, it's easy to be upset. And initially I was as well, I'll admit. But eventually, when you start slowly discovering what the island is really about, I felt the victim, or rather the hero, or anti-hero, the way how you put it, is not the people or the folks or the lovely people that I've met there, but it's rather nature itself. The fact that it was Ubin, there's so much granite to be forest, uh, to be sort of harvested out of there. And it was empty and people left. But yet, it continues to be a resource for us. It now sits there as a reservoir. There's something very beautiful about nature in that sense. And I was having all these thoughts while I was cleaning up my house. And I was a little frustrated because I was like, why is there always so much dust here? And it made me think that it's unfortunate, but that's almost the only constant that I realize on this island. So much has changed. Uh, if you want Pulau Ubin to be a symbol of rebe rebellion, it will be. If you want to be a symbol of nature, it will be. If you want to be a symbol of recreation, it will be. If you want it to be a resource, it will be. 
and it will morph and continue to accommodate to any of our ideologies because that's what it is. It is just as like granite is. It's resilient, it's beautiful, has years of sedimentation and meaning and layer underneath. And all that survives is dust that moves, and all that survives is not me and not you. So I do hope if you could sing along at some point at the end of this movie. Thank you very much.